I quite like the idea of being able to breathe underwater. It feels like kind of a superpower, kind of, really. It's quite exciting to be able to do things that if you didn't have all the gear, you just, you know, drown <laughs> after two minutes. It's been kind of cool, kind of in awe, you know, because I've been like learning about it at school. Like they teach you it every single year. Like they, they, you don't get any other history lessons <laughs> in primary school. All you get taught about is like the Endeavour and the First Fleet. It's kind of cool to see the people who like discovered its remains and seen studying it. It's quite, feels like the sort of people you see on TV but you never really meet. When I was growing up, uh, I, I went to school and, and, you know, grade five, grade six, high school, uh, primary school in WA. And Endeavour was seen as this fantastic ship of exploration and colonisation. And Cook was this amazing guy and all this sort of stuff. And of course, that's what history taught me then. And now, of course, we interpret Endeavour as a totally different vessel. And I see Endeavour as having all these multiple lives and each one has influenced multiple groups of people. My dad, you know, I think got fascinated by the underwater world. From about the age of five or six, I started going out on the boat with him. And, you know, so I was out on the boat with him and seeing them put their kit on and they all get in the water and, you know, do their dive and come back up, talk about all the awesome stuff they saw and just thought, man, I want to do that. How do I get to do that? You know, so. From about the age of five or six, I started nagging my dad just incessantly, like, Dad, when do I get to learn to dive? And he'd say, hey, you're too young, son. You can't do it yet. And then I did my first dive off the beach. Now, the first part of that was fairly chaotic because I was little. I had dive gear that, quite frankly, didn't fit me properly. Um, I was wearing a shorty tank, which was probably twice my weight. So, yeah, chaotic absolutely crazy I think probably through my head at one point I thought well, wait what am I actually why am I doing this this is a really terrible idea but as soon as we got past the breakers and we got out there and stuck my head in the water and started breathing off the rag like kind of had that initial sort of <laughs> and then like okay let's chill now all right then it got awesome I don't know it, it was very it was very comforting and it still is you know, I've been doing this, you know, I've been working in my profession for 25 years, but I've been diving since I'm nine years old. I'm 49 now, so do the math, you know. And I've been, it, it always comforts me. It, it's just, you know, when I get in the water, it, it's just a whole different frame of mind, you know, and everything just kind of clicks into place. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit, when I'm gearing up, and doing all the prep work prior to getting the water, I always get a bit nervous. I'm always nervous before every dive I do. Always have been. Um, you know, and there's all that sort of hectic energy with, you know, okay, is everything on, everything set up right? Well, you know, whoops, forgot to hook up my auto inflator. Better do that, you know. And so there's all of that, but as soon as you get in and you just kind of get in the water, bubbles disappear, and then, boom, focus. And away I go. And it's always been that way. Kids today got more noise in their lives than I did when I was a kid. I mean, they're getting bombarded with, you know, because <laughs> everything's digital now and everything's multimedia. It's, you know, and they've got, you know, phones and iPads and handheld devices and this, that, and the other, and cable television, and it's it's everywhere. It's everywhere all the time. And, um, yeah, having the opportunity to just sort of push all that away because really you can't have it when you're underwater you know? I mean there's the fundamental matter of most electronic devices and water don't get along so you know you can't take it in the water some you can admittedly now they've they've developed that but so you know you remove that factor and the other thing is the speech factor you know you can't talk and talking alone I think can be fairly overwhelming depending on the situation and that's one of the things I really love about diving, is that 
don't have to talk. And I don't have to listen to anybody talking. Um, and it's, yeah, that's magic. Like a lot of things where it's feel, it's hard to describe in words, but I think, probably for me, there's a certain type of focus that I develop when I'm underwater. Um, and that focus is calm. And it's the focus of, and it, you know, it's probably intuitive. It's just the fact that you're not in your natural environment. You know, like, I'm a land dwelling animal, really. I breathe air can't breathe underwater not without equipment you know um, and that's where I normally reside so when I get in the water I'm in a completely different environment and I think there's something in your brain that just kind of clicks on and it makes you focus more but there's something about that focus you know you start to you, know, you hear things you see things and there's something very calming about that to me and I don't quite it's very hard to explain why. You know, there's that sense of weightlessness. You know, it's amazing when you're underwater. You know, you've got all this gear on when you're on the boat or you're on the beach, but then you get in the water and all of that weight completely disappears, and all of a sudden you're in space. You know, um, and yeah, you can fly, you can float. You know, it's, it's so much less physically challenging, I think. And yeah, that's awesome too. I mean, I like the big joke I like to tell people is how did I become a maritime archaeologist? Well, I say, this is what I say. Well, I did land archaeology for a while and, you know, that involves digging holes in the hot sun, you know. Then I tried it underwater, which involves me laying on the bottom of the ocean, sucking dirt into an underwater vacuum cleaner. It's way better. I mean, why wouldn't I pick that option? Uh, yeah, because that's, there's something about that. It's that weightlessness. It's that but it's it's that expansive attention that you get that's just automatic, you know? And it is calming. It's really, yeah. I was diving with um, James. He's a leading marine archaeologist who is who uncovered the remains of the Endeavour. And I was with Heather, who is an expert in conservation. She conserves things after they've been like artifacts after, they, after they've been brought up out of the surface of the water. We were measuring an anchor, which was really old. It was from the 19th century. It was like half submerged in the sand, and it was a lot of fun. I'm Heather Berry. I'm a conservator for Silent World Foundation. I'm a maritime archaeological conservator, so I get to dive and look after artifacts using chemistry. Things like this project and being able to tell people what conservators do and who we are, you know, so often we work behind the scenes. You don't see us at museums and people don't know that we exist. So I think that this is really important to actually show children and adults that we do exist and hopefully that awareness means more people want to do it, creates more jobs and, and, and kids can get interested in going underwater because we get the best parts. The archaeologists, they just get to do some drawings underwater and raise artifacts, you know. Doesn't sound that fun to me, to be honest. But we get to look underwater at the artifacts. We get to assess their level of degradation or preservation. Sometimes they're in really good condition. We get to make judgment calls. Is this suitable to be lifted to the surface? Then once it's on the surface, Everybody be quiet, you have to listen to me. I'm telling you what to do with this artifact. So you get a lot of control and you then get to decide how to treat this object using science um, all the way through until it goes on display. So if you're a diving conservator, you can be there from the moment that an artifact is found and then raised all the way through to when it's put on display in a museum. I think what got me under the water was the fact that I could do archaeology there. So I wasn't, I'm not a great swimmer now, but I should be, but <laughs> shh, don't tell anyone, but I'm, I'm not a great swimmer now, but I'm very comfortable diving in dive gear and snorkeling and all that sort of stuff. I actually, to tell you a little story, when I was 11, I actually couldn't swim. And I went to a place called Lake Leisure Nolta in Western Australia, and my cousin had a mask and snorkel. And I put my mask and snorkel on, and all of a sudden I felt very, very comfortable underwater. Weird, 
weird because I couldn't actually swim and I had a fear of swimming, fear of the water. Mask and snorkel went on, saw the underworld world, saw fish, well, I think I saw fish, and I certainly saw sea grass and seaweeds and stuff in Lake Legend Alder, and from there it just clicked. It is a funny experience, and I've been always near the sea ever since. I think it certainly does, it really does resonate. I know it resonated with me at that age, and I think it's a great opportunity for kids to do. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. We, we, we walk around the streets of our cities and towns, we walk around the bush and so on, and we get used to that. It's a familiar landscape. But we go underwater and it's brand new, it's foreign. And every single time I dive, no matter how often I dive, it is a foreign landscape. And I'm always finding something new underwater, whether it's a shipwreck, whether it's a new animal or creature I've never seen before. I even get, I even get off on, on the ripples of sand on the seabed. That's the sort of thing I get. And I think many, many divers are like that. It's a whole new world, a whole new experience. And I also enjoy the quiet the quietness of underwater, just the sound of your breathing. And if you're working underwater, the tinkering of your tools that you're using and so on, but just brilliantly quiet. Except, and you also hear things like the shrimp snapping and the fish crunching and munching and other strange sounds in the distance, but it is very, very peaceful. It's a beautiful place to work. I kind of felt invigorating. The like, felt like you kind of have gills being able to breathe underwater and just felt like empowering. I'm gonna tell them about how I like breathe, about the scuba diving experience and how heavy everything was. It's, but then when, as soon as you get into the water, you feel like you don't weigh enough because you keep floating to the surface. So you weigh too much and not enough at the same time. It kind of just adds a whole other level to the ocean. Like, I was used to like the top of the ocean, maybe a bit below, but now it's opened up a realm of like another 10, 20 metres below it. I'd say to Leo, seize it. Look at it, seize it, and see where you can go. He's at a fantastic age. He's young enough now to start directing his interests towards the sea, if he wants to. At a very young age, he can start building up his diving experience. To me, archaeology is fantastic, but there are so many other areas of maritime research, marine research, that he could go into, or any other young person can go into. And yeah, have a look. Yeah, be intrigued, be taken, get enthused, and see where it goes from there. Yeah, because the underwater world really is a pretty far out thing, you know. Like if you've never, if, you, if you'd never seen it before, you know, you're just regular Joe living on land, never opened a book or saw a TV show or anything about what's underwater and you just got stuck in there, it would blow your mind because it is crazy, <laughs> you know. It's just all the stuff that's down there. The whole aquatic environment is just mind-bending. It really is. So I think, I think there's a lot of merit to that. The other thing I think it is, too, is that, quite frankly, kids are fearless. They're a lot more fearless than adults are. You know, they don't... You know, they understand danger and they understand threats, I think. But, you know, and I know this from, you know, being older now and thinking about how I was when I was, you know, nine years old and learning to dive and thinking about how I am now and, you know, as overwhelming as it was when I was a kid, like, kind of being thrust into that environment for the first time, I was so excited about it that any modicum of danger that was there just kind of got shoved off to the side. It's like, yeah, that could be a problem, but this is way cooler because... This is all new and exciting and awesome and I'm weightless, dude. I'm weightless. What? That's cool. <laughs>